I have been to Mecca about 10, 11 times. I haven't gone recently, but from 1991 to 2001, I went every year. And the main ritual that goes on at the Kaaba, whether it be during Umrah or during Hajj or just as a regular visit, is what's called Tawaf. And Tawaf is an Arabic word and it means circumambulation. So what is going on at the Kaaba when you get there is except during prayer times when everything stops and everyone faces the Kaaba in a big circle, people are circulating around the Kaaba in a circular pattern uh, going counterclockwise. And this goes on 24 hours a day without stopping. And whenever you go into the mosque of the Kaaba, the, the, the main floor, you begin to do that circumambulation. And as you do that, you recite whatever prayers come to you. And it is a recognition of where you are, because this isn't done anywhere else. And it is also a recognition of the flow of everything that exists within God's creation, because everything is circling in God's creation. Everything is in movement in God's creation. And we are also in movement. And the question that we all have to ask ourselves is, where are we moving? Where are we going? What is in the intention of all of this movement. And in the book of Hadith, the sayings of the prophet, the first Hadith talks about intention. So before we do anything, we have to set an intention and we have to constantly reset this intention. Every morning when we wake up, we should be setting our intention. What is our intention for the day? What is the intention for our movement? What is the intention for our action within the day? Circumambulation, the tawaf around the Kaaba, involves movement and intention and prayer. So there's a lot of things going on all at once. And if you ever see a picture of the Kaaba, and any of you can do this by going onto YouTube where almost anything is available right now, you can see the mass of people circling that area. At prayer time, that stops, and if you were able to do a picture from space, you could see people from all over the earth facing in that direction towards that one point, forming this enormous circle that covers the entire earth. Uh, again, the circular nature of things. Now, we exist and live our lives, this life, on a circular ball that is in a circular orbit that runs around a circular sun. So we need to understand 
that everything that goes around comes around. The earth circles the sun and comes to the same place at the end of a certain circumference. And at certain times during the year, the earth is in the same place. All of the planets are circling the earth and the sun. There is this gigantic movement that is going on all the time. And we need to be able to get ourselves into that movement. We need to understand the effect of that movement, and we need to become part of that movement, and we need to understand the circular nature of things. Whatever you throw out there is going to come back to you. Whatever you put out there is going to come back to you. And every step that we take is going to come back to us in one way or another. There is nothing that we do that doesn't have consequences on ourselves and on creation. So we each have to be very conscious of what it is that we do. Nothing is missed. Now, according to my sheikh, we have two angels, one sitting on each shoulder. And these angels record everything that we say and do. Now, imagine how important you are to creation that Allah has allocated angels to you to record you and to record everything that you say and do, to record all of your movements, to record all of your actions, and to record everything that goes on in your life. I was uh, once a uh, city solicitor of a city that was constantly uh, in the news about uh, things that were going on within the city. And it was constantly being investigated by all of the different agencies, uh, federal and state. And I learned very quickly that I had to be very careful what I said. I had to be very careful who I talked to. I had to be very careful where I appeared. And I had to be very careful how I presented myself. Now, this was just because I had newspapers watching me. Imagine if you have your own angels watching you and <laughs> they're constantly with you and they never leave. How careful do you have to be? Well, we have to be very careful. And what we have to do is make the intention that we will act appropriately, that we will act correctly, that we will act in a way that Allah will be satisfied with what we do. Now, we are all conscious people, and we've all been involved in this path for a lot of years. We all know the difference between right and wrong, and we are all in this world of illusion, striving to move from this illusory world into the world of reality. Veils keep us from reality, and these veils 
consist of our inappropriate tendencies and our inappropriate actions. Now, each of us has within us what are called the nafsamara, which are the animal qualities. So we have this part of divinity that Allah has given to us, but we also have within us simultaneously the animal qualities. And there is this struggle between the animal qualities and the divine qualities. The animal qualities are interested in animal tendencies and in the kinds of things that animals do. They are without a transcendent understanding of things, and they are caught up in illusion and the desire for the various aspects of illusion. They're caught up in wealth. They're caught up in fame. They're caught up in, in, in food. They're caught up in seeing beautiful things on this earth. They're caught up in lust. They're caught up in all of the small pleasures of the world. In Tamil, which is the language of our sheikh, they talk about the 64 worldly pleasures, and then they talk about the transcendent pleasures. And as long as you are involved in the worldly pleasures, the transcendent pleasures don't occur to you because you're too busy being involved with the worldly pleasures. And you think that sustenance and enjoyment and peace can come from these worldly pleasures. It's only after time and experience that you begin to learn about the illusory nature of these worldly pleasures and that they cannot continue to satisfy you. As a matter of fact, they turn against you. Sugar is sweet. Candy is sweet. Too much candy and too much sugar leads to diabetes. Diabetes isn't sweet. Diabetes is a disease that attacks your being. And it's like this. Whatever you get involved with in the illusory world, and in these illusory pleasures will dissipate you. It will take away from your being. It will attack you over time. What we need to find and what we need to get involved in are the transcendent pleasures, the transcendent understandings, the transcendent qualities. And these, as opposed to killing us, take us into eternality, take us into immortality, take us into everlasting life. So we have to make this change from one to the other. Now, it is said that every desire in this world will kill you except one. And that's the desire to know God, the desire to know Allah. So in the same way that we desire the world, we have to use this desire to want God. And our desire to want God has to become very great and very real. It has to become the most important thing to us. There is a Zen story about a man who went to a monastery and asked for a cone 
And those of you who know a little bit about Buddhism or Zen know that cones mean unsolvable riddles. And they're given in order for you to be able to break through into an understanding that is beyond words and beyond normal explanation. So he sat with the master for years, and the master finally gave him a cone. And the cone was, what is the sound of one hand clapping? And he said, go meditate on this. And he meditated for two years, and he couldn't come up with an answer. And he came back to the, uh, to the Zen master, and he said, I haven't been able to come up with an answer, and I, co I can't go back to my village. I can't quit and not have been able to solve your cone. He says, go do it for another uh, two years. So he did. And he came back and he said, I give up. I can't do it. Uh, I guess I'm not meant for this path. And then the master said, let's do it for three more days. And he went and did it for three more days and he couldn't do it. And he came back again and he said, I'm leaving. He said, do it for two more days and if you can't do it, then kill yourself. In two more days, he came back and said, I got it. The point being that you have to want it as if your life depended on it. And your life depends on it. And the, the, the master finally put him in a position where his life depended on it. Now, our lives depend on it. So we have to get this desire so strong within us as if our the life depended on it. And if we can bring it to that point, if we can get it to that kind of intensity, then transcendence will occur for us because we do whatever it is we think is most important for us. So if we think satisfaction of worldly lust is most important to us, we will chase worldly lust. If we think that understanding divine attributes, divine qualities, the gracious nature of our Lord is most important to us, then we will chase that. We will move towards that. We will do whatever we are told to do that is leading in that direction. So we have to constantly be taking stock of ourselves, and we have to constantly understand where we are as far as the strength and purpose of our intention. And one of the ways that we can strengthen our intention is to talk directly to Allah and to explain directly to Allah the status of our being, the status of our intentions, the difficulties that we encounter, the things that are hard for us, and the things that we need to overcome. We need to set up a dialogue with Allah. And at the core of setting up this dialogue is sincerity. We have to come to this dialogue from the depths of our being, from the depths of our heart, from the depths of everything we know and understand in order to set this dialogue up. It can't be a half-hearted thing, as they say. It has to be full throttle, and it has to be sincere. Shem says, 
wake up in the middle of the night and prostrate and scream to your God, howl to your God to ask to know him. There are many ways that we can go about this, but we have to set up some kind of direct line of communication. If you have a friend and that friend is important to you and you know your life depends on your communication with that friend, wouldn't you open up a dialogue with that friend and keep that dialogue going? Wouldn't you be involved in that dialogue as often as possible? It starts with the sheikh. Now, when I first met the sheikh, we would come once a week. Then we started coming twice a week. Then we started coming twice a week and staying in Philadelphia on the weekends. So we were up to about four times a week. The need to be with him became stronger and stronger and stronger. And the effort that we put forth to be with him became stronger and stronger and stronger. Getting to the point where it was difficult to be away from him. So what we need to do is we can either get in touch with the sheikh because he is always with us. We can get in touch with him through communication with him, or we can communicate directly with God because that's who the sheikh is taking you to. But the communication has to open up. Now, we were taught while the manifestation was with us how to be close to him, how to respect him, how to act in front of him. We have to take this knowledge of respect and bring it forward into our present communication with our Lord. We have to know how to act with our Lord. We have to have the, uh, the correct amount of reverence for our Lord. We have to have the correct amount of respect. And we have to have within ourselves the appropriate amount of humility. And humility is a very important aspect in our relationship with a sheikh or with our God. And humility comes about by making yourself small, by making yourself less than, by understanding the, ima the enormous majesty of Allah and the fact that we are a creation and totally dependent on Allah. Now, false humility doesn't work because these angels that are sitting on our shoulders know our sincerity. They understand the extent of our sincerity. And if the sincerity isn't there, they know that that sincerity isn't there. So understand that we have to come to a place of truth within ourselves. It's said by wise men that if you repeat a lie more than twice, you begin to believe it as if it was truth. So imagine how many lies we've swallowed and how many lives have been internalized within us and become and have become part of our being. Somehow, we have to regurgitate all of this 
that's happened. And this happens through repentance and asking for forgiveness. Now, in the beginning, when you ask for forgiveness, your requests are tepid. They're lukewarm because you don't understand the extent of how far you've gone astray because you can't see yourself clearly yet. But as you become more involved with repentance, as you get more involved in asking for forgiveness, you begin to understand the extent of the forgiveness that's necessary for us and the extent of the lies that we have told not only to the world but to ourselves and that we have begun to believe. So many lies have been told, so many lies have been swallowed, that it takes a lifetime of repentance to regurgitate all these, to bring them up and to face them. In the Conference of the Birds, the Sheikh of the Birds takes a group of birds, 30 birds, on a journey towards Allah, towards the Godhead. And on the way, they see all of the mistakes that they've made in their lives. They go through all of the lies that they've told and all of the great difficulties uh, that have been placed on them. And one of the stories, or the, the main story that's repeated, uh, is they're on the threshold of entering into the kingdom of God. And then he stops and tells this story. Joseph's brothers were sent by Jacob to Egypt in order to get food because there was a famine in Canaan and in Egypt they had made provisions for the famine. And they packed their bags and they packed donkeys and uh, saddlebags and they went off to Egypt to get food. When they arrived, Joseph, who had risen from the time that his brothers had thrown him in the well, and he was taken from the well by a caravan and sold into slavery in Egypt, and he had risen through God's assistance, of course, to a place where he was one of the king's most important ministers, and he was in charge of the food during the famine. And he was told that there were strangers who were coming looking for food. And he said to bring them in, and uh, they came in, and he said, what, what is it that you want? And they said, our elderly father sent us to bring food back. Uh, we are brothers, and we come asking for your kindness and your mercy and your compassion to give us food. And he said, well, I'll decide. I'll be back with you shortly. And he then directed some of the people who worked for him to put objects from the palace into the saddlebags of the donkeys that the men had brought. Then he brought them in again with their donkeys. And he said, you say you come to ask for food and that's all you want. And they said, yes, it's true. And then he said, and you say that you came here with open hands to request and beg for our mercy. And they said, yes. And he said, 
But in truth, you came as thieves and you came as liars. And they said, they all complained bitterly. We have never done anything wrong. We have never had any ill intent. We come as pure men to seek food for our starving family. And he says, oh, is that true? And then he had his men take all the things out of the saddlebags. And they all claimed, we have no idea how this happened. We are innocent. We are pure men. And then Joseph began to speak to them in Hebrew, which was their original language. And they understood at that moment who he was and what they had done. For each of us, that moment will come into being. We will be professing our innocence when a tape of what went on will be shown to us. We need to be able to bring up all of those tapes out of ourselves and bring them into the forefront of ourselves. It is through judging ourselves that we will be able to avoid meeting that kind of judgment. It is through judging ourselves and being truly honest with ourselves and asking for forgiveness for what has been done that we will be able to save ourselves from judgment. It is said that there are 73 tribes in all of humanity. One tribe out of the 73 goes through this exercise of self-judgment. One tribe of all of the people brings up all of the truth about what their life has been and what they've gone through and brings it out into the open before themselves and before God and admits it and asks for forgiveness and is sincere in that forgiveness. That one tribe is able to bypass judgment. That one tribe doesn't have to go through what the other 72 have to go through. When we do the zikr, the, the, the names of the remembrance of God, or any group does a zikr, the zikr almost always starts with astafa la azim. Astafa la azim, astafa la azim, which means God forgive us for what we've done. So, forgiveness is a very large part of our effort in finding reality. Going through our own life and going through our own faults and going through our own difficulties and going through our own lies to ourselves and to the world is a very big part of what we need to accomplish. So we need to enter into a state of repentance. We need to enter into a state of humility. We need to enter into a state of self-honesty so that all the lies that we've told ourselves, this image that we've created about who we are is erased and we become small and humble before our Lord. And we are without guile, without pretense. We are truthful and honest and and attempting to transcend all that we have done before. Now, repentance is in two parts. You have to give up what you've done in the past, and then you have to detach from it. You can't give up whatever it is that you're asking forgiveness for and then go out the next day and do it again and go and repent again. That's not repentance. Repentance is an end to things. Repentance is a new start to things. Repentance is a new way of being. Repentance 
is to be born again. Repentance is to die to your old life and to be born again into a new life that is without all of the things that have been with you up to now. So at each moment, we need to be in a state of repentance. And it's something that never ends because the degree of repentance becomes more and more and more as we become purer and purer and purer. We need to be able to continue to purify ourselves until we are worthy of God's kingdom, until we are worthy of God's qualities, until we are capable of entering into that realm where the gracious nature of our God exists. Inshallah, it will come for each of us. And may we all be able to open up this dialogue with our Lord where we are sincere and where we speak honestly and truthfully with our Lord. Ya Allah, take us to the place of sincerity. Take us to the place of reality. Take us deep within ourselves so that we see all of our faults and we admit them freely before you, that we let go of them and detach ourselves from them, that we are no longer driven by them, that our animal self no longer is the priority in our existence, that our animal self no longer has control over the truth within us, that the truth within us rises and becomes what and who we are, that that part of us that is from you becomes our reality, and that we are in touch with that and through that in touch with you. Take us to the place of Hakikat, where man is intermingled with God, so that we may be intermingled with you and know the truth of existence and take from us all that does not that does not belong to you. Make us small and make us humble before you so that our true greatness can be known and our true greatness is the worship of you. May you do that for each of us. Amin. Amin. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.